Will you please be seated? And let us pray together. As parched earth awaits your rain showers, so do our souls await the water of your spirit. Teach us that which is eternal, O God, in Christ, through Christ. Amen. This lesson is very well known of Lazarus and the rich man. The lesson that was also read, the epistle lesson, is Paul's letter to a young pastor, Timothy. And in a sense, it echoes what is said by Jesus in the story of rich man and Lazarus. Remember the words that Phil read. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge a person into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced their hearts with many pangs. We as Presbyterians say we believe in providence, the providence of God. And I find it particularly ironic that these, this crescendo by Paul of warnings about the love of money, about the dangers of seeking after wealth alone, I find it ironic that they come on the very same day that the series Breaking Bad comes to a conclusion. Some of you may know that series on television. It's a powerful, powerful series. A host of Emmys have been won for writing, Actors, actresses, supporting. I have little doubt that Hollywood knows what the lectionary text is. But I do find it ironic, ironic that right here today, these texts appear. The love of money is the root of all evil when this reaches its conclusion, this breaking back. Arguably, it is the best television series in this century. It is a story about a man, Walter White, who lives in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Walter is a chemistry teacher at the local high school. He lives a quiet life. He is a quiet man. He has a family, a special needs son who is a teenager, and a pregnant wife. And then it happens. He is diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer. With the chemotherapy, he might be able to live for two years. And all he would leave behind would be his wife and his newborn child and his son, $7,000 and a very large mortgage. This saga tells the story of a man, a good man, who makes a bad choice for some very good reasons in an effort to leave his family some money. He decides that he will be the cook 
for methamphetamine. And he excels in his ability to make crystal meth. As the story concludes this evening, he has now made $42 million in the two years. In this series, Breaking Bad, we are exposed to the raw underbelly of a world that most of us will never know. Even though Walter's financial future for his family is secure, he loses them in this maddening, frenetic, downward spiral from a good man. He goes to being a monster. Very, very similar to Robert Louis Stevenson's story of Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. That we are just, just one choice away from being a human and turning into a Walter White or a monster. And perhaps even whether they intended it or not, Breaking Bad is is a morality story about the American middle class. Like Walter White, do we not in one sense want to make choices that will benefit us financially, but perhaps some of those choices are detrimental, detrimental to our very soul? I do not know what will happen from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. tonight. But I intuit it will end badly. But one thing is for certain. I will tell you Breaking Bad is the best sermon illustration that I have ever seen, heard, or read. On Paul's text to Timothy, the love of money is the root of all evil. This is the eleventh time in my ministry that the lectionary text of Lazarus and the rich man has rolled around. I remember the first time I preached upon these texts that come to us today in the common lectionary. I made the statement, money is the root of all evil. And in the greeting line out there, this older woman could not wait to tell me that I had misquoted the Apostle Paul. She said, no, Richard, the love of money is the root of all evil. And she was spot on. If you were to take out a dollar bill right now and look at it, what is it worth? Well, there are two value systems going on there. There is the value of what that piece of paper, special paper, and special ink cost. And then there is the value of what is known as legal tender. And legal tender is where we put faith that the United States government can back that money at Fort Knox with gold or some other commodity. It's a symbol. You can take out a $1 bill and a $100 bill and say, well, they're both worth the same regarding paper and ink, and yet one regarding legal tender is worth 100 times more than the other. Money has only value which human beings give to it. Money is a neutral commodity. So, 
though, in a sense, the woman who said it is the love of money that is the root of all evil was very correct, except how many of us use that as the escape clause? How many of you love money? Raise your hand. One, two honest people. Two honest people in this sanctuary. We had one. Y'all are doing better than the early church. In a sense, we do. How many of you have ever daydreamed that you won the Powerball 100 million? Raise your hand now. Ah, now we're getting closer to the truth. I have. How many have ever thought if I just had a certain amount of money, I could be satisfied? I would not have to worry. Now, I don't want you to go out of here saying that your pastor is preaching against do with your money is between you and God. But how do you think a hundred million dollars got into that? The money fairy came down and put it in the Powerball? No. Individuals betting that they might win or hoping or praying. The point is is that our love of money is the sweet siren song that will bring us closer to the reef of ruin. Paul says it will cause senseless and hurtful desires that plunge a person to ruin and destruction, piercing our very hearts with pain. One of the fastest ways to kill a church is to constantly preach about money. I know that some churches do it and do it frequently. I've heard of some churches passing the plate twice because there was not enough in it. Now the session knows that I am not much of a fundraiser. I do not believe in gimmicks. I do not believe in guilt. As a matter of fact, I do believe just as individuals can be lovers of money, so can certain nonprofit organizations. But the fact of all of Christianity comes down to this. At least from the way I see it. It's about freedom. When we hear these texts, even though they may put us off for a second, it is really about your freedom to live in the joy of God's glory and creation and with one another with exceeding joy. It is about the paradise which will one day come touching our lives even now. You see, what Paul writes doesn't threaten me. Because I know that the Word of the Lord which is living is always about helping us to be free from the slavery that that can shackle us to lives that we learn and to hate and deplore. The story of the rich man and Lazarus. There wasn't anything wrong with the man being rich. He didn't do anything wrong. He just didn't do anything. Jesus said last week, you cannot serve two masters. Now, some say that's negative. 
I'm saying from where I stand, it seems to be the truth that we will either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. And if we would be free in this life to joy and to experience life in its fullness, we need to put to death the one master. Why do we give anyway? I believe it's a declaration of independence from the master of the love of money. We declare our independence. What is that flag they flew over the Alamo with the cannon? Come and take it. That's what we're saying. I recently received a note from someone who used to be a member of this church, still is, but had to move far away, considers this her church home. And Jim, I told you I was going to preach about you. Wes, you're included because you're sitting at the camera. And all of those of you who have sat there and wondered, is this worth taking the film of the preacher? Is all the preacher want to do is go home and watch himself on television? I've never seen me on television. I can assure you that. But through this particular ministry, this individual is still connected to this body of Christ. still feels that sometimes she is actually sitting in our congregation. And then, at the end of the card, the check fell out. I can see you want to know how much it was. Is that before my cut or after? Five figures. Because of what you guys do. And I want to tell you, this is a person who has declared herself independent from the love of money. It happens to me so often. I get off on Sunset Boulevard 281, going south, and I've never been able to catch the light green. And there is always this little man standing over on the left-hand side. I know he has a secret thing that he'll keep it turning red. He has his remote that will turn the light red. And he is a Vietnam vet, he says on his sign, and he doesn't drink. Well, here I am getting off at 281, and I am pondering, oh Lord, what am I going to do for the 11th time on the rich man and Lazarus? What can I do that makes a difference? What, what can I say that I haven't already said? And the little man punches the light red. And I sit there. Don't look. Don't look, don't even look out of the corner of your eye at the man. And then it hit me. I'm preparing a sermon about the rich man and Lazarus, and I won't even look at the Lazarus standing next to my window. And I gave him something. And the fresh winds, the freedom of spirit in God swept across my soul. What irony that the preacher is going to speak on the rich man and Lazarus and won't look at the Lazarus
by his window. What irony that the lectionary text is about being free from the love of money. What irony that breaking bad, which spells out specifically the love of money, is the root of all evil. What irony. But you know, sometimes I think that God it uses irony to get his word across. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Mm -hmm.